Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great show for you tonight. Our guest tonight is Andrea Herman, a longtime expert in the field, hemp, a pioneer who has been pioneering hemp seed and hemp food production, hemp fiber production, and working with the Canadian government and past president of the Hemp Industry Association. So stay tuned for that interview. Uh, and first we'll come out with our infamous dancing, Cannabis Leaves. I feel the force. Here we have one story tonight. The United States House Committee on Appropriations voted this week to approve an amendment that would prevent the Department of Justice from interfering with legal adult use marijuana programs as part of the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies Appropriations Legislation for fiscal year 2023. The bipartisan amendment would bar the Department of Justice from using resources to interfere with the ability of states, territories, tribal governments, or the District of Columbia to implement laws and regulations governing the legal and regulated production, sale, and use of cannabis by adults or to target people acting in compliance with those laws. This amendment was approved by the full House of Representatives as part of the annual spending omnibus bill for the last two years, but is yet to be included in the final legislation. Since 2014, members of Congress have passed annual spending bills that have included a provision protecting those who are in compliance with state medical cannabis programs from undue prosecution by the Department of Justice, including these protections for all people that are legally acting in the federal budget will go a long way toward giving individuals, businesses, and state governments some peace of mind while signaling that the vast majority of Americans support legalizing and regulating cannabis, that their elected representatives are actually listening to them. Our own elected representative here in River City, Portland, Oregon, is U.S. Representative Earl Blumenauer, and he said, quote, Congress must honor the will of the voters and prevent wasteful Department of Justice prosecution of those complying with respective states or tribes' cannabis regulations. I have spearheaded the work to develop the language which protects the state and tribal legal programs that have been enacted laws to end prohibitionary policies and allow the development of both adult use and medical marijuana programs." End quote. The official DOJ internal guidance to deprioritize prosecution of people acting in compliance with state cannabis laws was in place from 2013 to 2018 when former Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded the Cole memo. A recently as April, Attorney General Merrick Garland has reiterated his position that it's a waste of DOJ resources to interfere with state cannabis programs. Unfortunately, such guidance has not been officially renewed under the current administration and does not carry the force of law, and federal prosecutors have a great deal of discretion in terms of the cases they pursue. There are currently 19 states, as well as the District of Columbia, and several territories where cannabis is legal for adults, and 37 states have effective medical cannabis laws. All national and state polling show significant majority support for making cannabis legal. We're still working for that day. So our interview with Andrea Herman comes next. She's the author of a, a new children's book as well to her illustrious background. It's uh, Tra La La's Journey to the Valley of C Singing Flowers. So stay tuned for that. And remember, work to restore hemp. Good night. I'd like to welcome back to Cannabis Common Sense, Andrea Herman, who uh, 
is a past president of the Hemp Industrial Association. Am I saying that right? Yep, the Hemp Industries Association. All right, and you're growing hemp in Manitoba now and other things and children. <laughs> yes, exactly. <clears throat> One child, his name is Ezra, and yes, part of a company that directly contracts with producers across um, the Prairie Provinces, plus now also contracting in the U.S. All right, and the name of your company, are you still involved with Hemp Innovations? So basically, um, my principal is with HPS Food and Ingredients. We are a bulk hemp food manufacturer and also are expanding our portfolio right now to include fava beans, lentils, and flax. But I really hold down the um, for for on the hemp side as part of our culture creation team, um, part of our inside sales and ownership, but really providing those bulk whole, whole hemp food ingredients. You've been in our studio back when we were before the pandemic, when we were recording and at the Hemp Stock Festival several times. And we've been to numerous conferences together from Japan to Uruguay. And. It's a real pleasure to have you back on the show again. Well, Paul, you uh, you have inspired so many, not just myself, but so many with your TV show and, and just all the freedom fighting that you and your team um, have done since the you know really beginning of, of most of our times and, and really being one of those people that were boots on the ground in the beginning and are still boots on the ground now. And that's that really says something about your preservation uh, and perse perseverance yes. um, in staying in the industry and, and still having a strong voice heard internationally. So both you and Teresa and your team. Thank you, I appreciate that. So let's go back to the beginning, Andrea. How did you first find out about hemp and how did you get involved with hemp in the very beginning? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, first it was on the marijuana side so being young, my my friends, I we had a joint, and that's where I first learned about cannabis. Uh -huh. um, so around uh, young, and I, you know, I was like, oh, well, what is this, and what's this all about? Well, then being from the state of Missouri, I found out that we had, you know, this thing called the Battle of the Hemp Bales, and there was this history of hemp in Missouri, and and then that really started to strike a chord with me about you know oh yeah marijuana great 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 but hemp wow like this is something that is for everyone everywhere um so from that i just started kind of learning of course i got jack's book the hemp wears no clothes which most of us have in our collection and that really opened up more for my mind about what was going on with hemp and how uh, you know, it could impact our lives. So that was a real precursor book, like so many people um, getting, that was the text. That was the educational book that was out there at the time for us to really learn deeper into what was going on with him. You know, it was before the internet and all of that. And by the time I got into university, I had already started writing papers on him and trying to dig out as much research as I could, which was limited. And I had to go to the university library to try to find information because our library at high school didn't have it and then by the time I got into university it was really um, the educators that started to you know really want me to hone in on what I was passionate about and my professor at Missouri Southern State University said uh, you know he said Andrea you, you've got to declare a major you got about two years left you've kind of gone and you got all your backcourts really time to decide and I said well none of these biology yes um but not really and i because we mostly had like botany and zoology and i was like well maybe political science but not really and so from that um uh, if you've heard of which most people probably have heard of dennis weaver so mm, dennis weaver yeah. the the actor in an older age became an environmentalist so yeah. dennis weaver um when I was in high school, we watched some documentaries in an entrepreneurship class that I was involved in. And it was, we watched this documentary on Dennis Weaver building this tire home. And then I found out that Dennis Weaver went to my university when it was a junior college. And he had keyed this term called economics. And economics is the study of biology, political science, sociology, and economics all tied together 
And his philosophy basically said that you cannot create sustainability without those four areas of academia working together. One might be the catalyst for another. So maybe it's the economics, but there maybe there was a political driver. So let's just say for recycling. Um, the town wants to put in a recycling program that if you can recycle a certain amount of things, you have to or you're going to get a fine. So the economics forced a restaurant to start to recycle because of a political movement, or maybe it was internally a biological thing that happened where they said, oh, we're concerned about the environment, so we want to make sure that we're recycling. Um, so from that, I went I went, um, Dennis Weaver started this a colonomics capstone course where you could get an accreditation. Well, what I did then was turned my bachelor's into a bachelor's of general studies, focused on the colonomics principles as hemp as the key crop. Mm -hmm. So everything I started to do in my last two years of university had to be hemp focused. Um, and it was really because I had an amazing professor who said to me, he said, I want to know what pisses you off. I want to know what you wake up every single morning and you're like, this is wrong. Why, why is this wrong and what can I do? And I said, it's the hemp thing. And he says, well, go, go make the change. Go be that person. And wow, you're a great yeah, great professor, great university, willing to like back me on something, um, and, and so that really, you know, having that support in, in academia really allowed me to realize what I what I had my passion for and really what what made me ring as a person and brought really brought my person to life. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So you have your bachelor's degree there in general studies, but don't you have a advanced degree now? Yeah. So from that, um, I earned an internship when I was in my undergrad and you know this is very like I remember the computer being quite dated and um, early on so in 2000 I sent a couple emails out looking for an internship working with him so I basically just said my name is I go to school here I'm interested in information and contacts pertaining to um, an internship working with industrial hemp and I got a message back from the Parkland Industrial Hemp Growers in the Dauphin, Manitoba area. Pardon me. And from that, they, they, so I got an internship working with the Parkland Industrial Hemp Growers in the summer of 2001, which really, that's what changed the course of my life was that, that opportunity, the email that I got from Sue Schlingerman, which, you know, I owe it to Sue. She said she was meditating and she heard like bluegrass music and banjo player. And I'm, I'm into that kind of music. It came to her and she said the next morning when she went to work, my email was there and she just knew that, that's, that, that there was something tied to that. So by the end of the day, I had an internship secured with the Parkland Industrial Hemp Growers assisting in their breeding program, which brought me to Canada. And from that, the plant breeder at the time asked me, you know, like, what do you want to do in your future? And I said, I would love to become part of the plant breeding team. And so from there, I applied to the provincial nominee program in Canada. Go ahead. Here was that. That was in 2001. Okay. okay. So I got the inter internship in 2000. And then it was to go in summer of 2001. Um, and so I, I got a little bit of grant money from the university. I was living on my own and totally supporting myself. And I had, you know, I had a mortgage payment and other things that I had to really think about. So it was the first time I took out a student loan so I could pay my car payment and my mortgage payment so I could come and do this internship, a free internship. But boy, did I ever earn so much from that free internship. I might not have made any money, but boy, what I earned, what I learned and gained from that, um, changed the course of my life and changed the course of a lot of people's life that trickled down after me that I was able to share and inspire from. So from that, I applied through the provincial nominee program and became a, um, and, and they had a unique skills workers division of that um, nominee program. And so one is I applied to the province and became no, uh, recognized as a unique skilled worker with a unique skill that could train other Canadians to do work in this area that was lacking Canadian expertise. 
And then I became a landed immigrant. And then about seven years ago, I became a Canadian citizen, now holding dual citizenship. So My wife holds dual citizenship, too. She's, in fact, I just recently, about a year and a half ago, got her her Canadian passport for the first time. Oh, wow. I didn't know. I didn't know that about Teresa. That's so cool. What province? Where, like, where was she born at? Or was it like? In fact, she lived in Halifax till she was five. And then she moved with her, her mother's from here in Portland. So that's when she moved back here. But, uh, you know, with a Canadian passport, you have to have another Canadian passport holder validate that I know this person and this person's real. So I asked uh, Jody Emery. Jody Emery was the uh, uh, the person who signed on to her passport. So that was Oh, her. Jody, so much to her also. And Mark, she seems so wonderful and she's looking so great as usual. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I was really fortunate that um, the host family that took me in continued to take me in. And from that, um, the Canadian government had some funding for education come down through one of their agricultural funding programs. And we applied and I, er, I, got, I got the grant, which paid for my master's um, in plant science. So I did a fiber agronomy trial. And so that was really successful and and also learned a lot there on, you know, time management, staff management, because you're working with summer students, planning, you know, the trials, the data collection, the data analysis, and then writing your thesis. So from that, I earned my master's of plant science and hemp agronomy. And that was in 2004. I completed that. Um, I let me see. I immigrated in 2004 and then completed that around 2008, 2009. I see. I see. So when did you first get involved with the Hemp Industry Association, the HIA? I am our longest standing board member now of 12 years being on the board and have been involved in the association for probably 25 years. So you remember years and years ago when the DEA was initially trying to block hemp, we had these right. like the DEA hemp picnics. So I was involved before um, either as a, like as a part of a, another company. So I was at Hemp Oil Canada for a long time as part of their sales team. So I was industry liaison there. So I was helping and doing committee work for them. But I have been a standalone as my own person member um, and on the board for almost 12 years now. So next next this coming year, I will be the longest standing board member of the association's history. Tell us more about the HIA. So the HIA is our national nonprofit in the U.S. So we have the HIA in the U.S. We have the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance in Canada and the European Industrial Hemp Association in Europe and, and others. And, and, and now you're starting to see these associations really inform whether you have the Japanese or you have look what's going on in um, Australia and um, New Zealand. So having these national associations are really beneficial when we need to come together as an industry. So. The Hemp Industries Association's history goes way back to Jack and Larry Serbin and others who really started that as BACA, the Business Association of Cannabis, something like that, um, with Chris Conrad and, you know, all, all you founding folks that really were there in the beginning, really getting that off. Um, so we are the longest standing hemp like hemp association there are uh, and, and they have formed with other kind of pockets of expertise and pockets of movement but the hemp industry associations really is about you know pulling people together getting that information out there and you know and then just start kind of growing as the industry is growing and as the industry has become more diverse um, especially when you know when the the concept of like the flower only hemp started to really take its legs in the industry, um, which is not something that I think any of us really particularly saw coming in one sense, um, you know, and, and now, you know, talking about smokable hemp. I mean, I would have never thought we would be down the road of smokable hemp. Um, and, you know, because I think for such a long time, too, we were like, oh, yeah, you could smoke a telephone pole of that. It would never do anything for you. But now right. we have science to back other other topics. And, you know, as more cannabinoids were discovered and our receptors are discovered and all of these things, it started to change 
the way we were are using that hemp plant. Yeah, I remember that uh, the same fellow in Israel who discovered the THC molecule discovered where the team at uh, Hebrew University, Raphael Mukulam, discovered the endogenous hemp and named it anandamide after the Sanskrit word for bliss. Mm. But uh, back when I started, I <clears throat> only knew about three cannabinoids. Then I think in the mid 70s, they said there were eight and then it was 15. And now there's like 150 and they're discovering more all the time. And just finding out about the, the usefulness of CBD and now CBG is uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah. And I think even when we start to look at the, you know, the the hemp seed grain in itself and, and what it can be um, made into and, and still the markets that we have to still open up. I mean, I remember being, you know, I remember taking press cake to the dump and like literally just kicking, trying to kick a bulk tote off the back of the truck um, because we didn't have a protein market yet. And then, you know, we had we had oil and we maybe had hauled hemp seed, but, you know, those things. And now we're starting to see those foods really start to get in, in the mainstream where you're having, you know, like the IGAs or the superstores or the Walmart kind of brands come on with hemp in their ingredients. And, and that's really what I want to see happen to hemp foods is it becomes an ingredient. It's not so much that your food is totally marketed on that. Um, you know, we kind of saw this in flax. So there for a while, when flax was really coming out onto the market, it's like, oh, it contains flax. Oh, it contains flax. Well, now flax is just an ingredient. Um, yes, it's something they can still market on, but it's not like they really hone out the fact that, you know, there's flax in this bar. So we're starting to see more of that also where hemp just becomes part of the ingredient um, for its functionality and not so much just as a, as a, as a little like, you know, marketability tag. So how, what, what's your current company and, and how did you transition to your current career path? Yeah, so when I departed from Hemp Oil, um, I started a, a consulting company and that really gave me the opportunity to widen the work I was doing and, and really allowed me to start really working and helping people's dreams come true true when it came to hemp. So I really enjoyed my 10 or so years of just straight up consulting. And then HPS started up and they, you know, they came to me and said, hey, you know, you, we know you've got some background in food. Would you help us start up the bulk hemp food company? And so now that's been seven years ago. I've been back, um, you know, working full time at, for a company. Thankfully, I'm able to work from home, which is amazing because now that I have a four year old, that really, I, I really appreciate the fact that I can continue to have my home office and, and that my husband and I can be full time in our son's life and not have to go to daycare, which is, you know, great if you can. If you can't, I understand 100%, but it, it's really nice from that point of view. So my principal role is just managing, I'm one of the operations, so just making sure that all the orders are flowing in and out correctly, working with production, working with our grain allocation team on making sure when, when stuff is coming in and getting that product allocated. So I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a fun job. And now that we're starting to see um, other commodities come in, and those are all based on our sister relationship with our sister company, Hemp Genetics International, which is now joined up with Verve on the genetic side. So we the sister company have been breeding hemp for now – since the early 2000s, they were part of the group that first brought, brought over some of the Vavla grain that came over early days here in hemp. So our, our team has really been involved in the hemp industry in Canada since they turned it around in 1998. When they That's when it became re-legalized in May of 1998 is when it was re-recognized. And of course, prior to that, there was some trials that were going on and, of course, some government movement with Ernie Small. If you've not had Ernie on your show, you should try to get Ernie Small on here He's, he's amazing. Um, I'll, I'll do a little introduction there. He worked with Dave Marcus from over at Pure Hemp Papers. Okay. Um, really great guys. So, and Ernie's part of kind of the government, but he's the one who tagged that 0.3% in the field. Um, and then the, the 10 parts per million. So one of the things about Canada, unlike in the U.S., is that we have a Delta 9 limitation on the food products. So it cannot have more than 10 ppm Delta 9 THC 
in the food product. We have no regulation side for CBD, CBG, or any other cannabinoids total or not when it comes to what's in the food. But you're starting to see those types of regulations and, you know, Australia, New Zealand, they will have started setting limits on, you know, CBD, 75 ppm or, or less is allowed. So, you know, unlike in the U.S., we have no um, THC regulation and whatever, T, you know, when someone says THC to me, it doesn't mean a lot because there's a lot of THCs now. So yeah. which THC are you talking about? So you have to be very clear when you're communicating that message. Uh, but that's one thing that we don't have stateside yet is any regulations pertaining to the amounts of this THC like we do in Canada. And it's set in stone and we have one regulation here. So if you're in BC, Nova Scotia, the prairies, Northwest Territories, it doesn't matter. You all still function underneath the same regulation, which falls underneath our Cannabis Act, which houses both hemp and marijuana underneath the same act. And then we, they just have different offices that kind of help control or manage that paperwork. I see. So as a hemp farmer, <clears throat> how you, when you harvest the, your crop, how do you start preparing for the next year? And what is the, the process you go through from preparation to planting, to harvesting, to, to marketing for hemp fruit products? Yeah, great question. Well, first, you've got to get your license. So it's free. It's online now, which is amazing. They used to have like all these different schedules. You'd have to fill out like seven different pieces of paperwork. And, you know, half the paperwork was all the same information as the first paperwork. Well, now it's all online, which is really great. It makes it super easy to go in and renew. And now they're giving us five-year licenses, which is also great. So your farm or your whether like basically your site license. So your home yard gets licensed and then every year, then you have to report um, where you're growing at because often what would happen is that back in the day, you would have to license a particular field. Okay. So that field would get a lot of rain and you wouldn't be able to plant in that field. You'd plant in another field. So you'd have to create an amendment document and send it in. And, and so that was happening lots to where, you know, it was a lot of paperwork for farmers to do. They're busy. And many of them living very rurally did not have good internet service. Um, so, you know, you're printing out and then you're chicken scratching on this paperwork and having to send it back into Ottawa and wait for them to come back. So now with the automated system, it's, it's super easy to go in and fill out those documents and report whatever you need. They've made some substantial changes to um, to the regulations, which has been some to the benefit um, and then some that still need need work on. So basically first is you get your license. So you got to have your license to be able to buy your grain, to buy your planting seed. And we do have a pedigree planting seed system here. So those are what you're buying is at the certified level and you cannot bin run that planting seed. So once you plant it and you harvest, that's grain, that's it. It has to go off to processing. You cannot repropagate that grain. I and see. that's mostly for the genetics. As we know, like this plant wants to change, it wants to morph um, and it, it is very adaptable. So that's why you'll see so many varieties also being grown because, you know, a variety that's going to grow well in northern Alberta might not do, do so well in southern Ontario, um, which is a long ways away from each other. Yeah. So there's different varieties that are growing in different locations, um, really based on, you know, are you under irrigation? Is it dry land? Um, you know, and also on what kind of equipment you have. So some of the varieties are the shorter statured varieties, so three to five feet, and some are higher, five to 10 feet tall, let's say. So, you know, it depends on what kind of machinery you have and how, you know, what varieties are known to be growing well in your environment. So one, so knowing, you know, going to the ag days, going and visiting with other farmers that are growing, talking, you know, at, at coffee talk in the morning at the local cafe, finding out what varieties have grown well. Um, we always suggest to get a contract, a grain contract that helps you also because typically those grain contracts come along with agronomist that can help you develop your crop rotation, um, talk to you about field selection 
and you know and what hemp should and should not be grown after you know fertilizers um, there are some grassy herbicides that are approved here in Canada so farmers conventional farmers do have the right to spray if they choose but it's better to focus on crop rotation um, weed suppression um, instead of relying on herbicides but there are some that are registered again those are grassy herbicides because hemp is a broadleaf so you can't kill off broadleaf in a broadleaf or you'll kill your hemp too um, so those have been proven to have you know their efficacy and um, so, you know, really focusing on that. So once you've got your field selection in, you do your planting, then you're really kind of in a sit and wait. And then once it comes time harvest, again, you know, this is, you know, people say, oh, you know, it doesn't take a miracle to cultivate a weed. Well, yeah, maybe once it goes in the ground, you can sit back, but there has to be quite a bit of care taken on the grain side to make sure that you're taking it off at the right moisture content, you're drying it down to around eight or 9%. And then you're rotating that to make sure you're not getting hot pockets in your bin, um, keeping that under aeration because if it spikes in its moisture, then you're going to get mold and moisture um, condensation in the bin, which could ruin a pocket of hemp in the bin, which then basically ruins the whole bin. So there's a lot of care that needs to be taken on the side of the farmer. Um, during the off season or the winter season or the grain storage portion of the season to make sure that, that grain is stored properly. And, and then also we as a company are, are pulling samples from those bins and having those farmers send us samples multiple times so we can monitor the grain quality to make sure the grain quality is retained and is good. And then once that comes in, um, you start, you know, you really have a, a, a huge QA presence in, in the product um, because of the fact that at the end of the day you're selling a food grade product and you want to have the most strictest quality assurance that you can to make sure that the product is safe. So you've got to have a, one of the best things I think is you've got to have a contract to be able to sell it. And that's that's the bottom line for many farmers and unfortunately a lot of hemp farmers start out and they they hard they are plant they don't know what they're getting into. We ran into that with the introduction of, of hemp across the United States and a lot of people lost their shirts and in some cases committed suicide. But uh, you've got a lot more of an infrastructure there in Canada to help with this, I see. Yeah, I mean, now granted, we had the same bumps in the road in the beginning too. There were, you know, we, for instance, here in Manitoba, there was a company called CGP, Consolidated Growers and Processors. They flew in and they said, oh, don't worry about a thing. You just plant it. We'll take it. We'll process it. We'll get the equipment. We'll get all this stuff. And they and then they file bankruptcy. And then mm -hmm. they had a, I mean, a mass amount of grain and a mass amount of fiber sitting in the field. And these farmers going, what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to do? We've, we've, we've stuck our necks out here. What are we going to do? Um, and then, you know, thankfully, great companies, like particularly here in Manitoba, Fresh Hemp Foods, Manitoba Harvest, Hemp Oil Canada, Dr. Bronner's, Bruce Foods, they all started to step in and really start to fight that battle and, and pull up from the bootstraps and say, all right, we can't rely on CGP, we got to do this ourselves. So, you know, those, those companies are the ones that really, um, you know, came together, sat down at the table, uh, not only starting the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, but also really, you know, said, okay, we've got to put this hip food out there. And it was some, you know, it was some young guys and gals who came together and said, all right, we're going to build some processing facilities. We're going to put in some oil crushing. Let's, let's start this. And now, you know, now some of those are huge corporations um, that have product on the shelves internationally. What are those companies? Uh, that would be like Fresh Hemp Foods. Um, so their brand, Manitoba Harvest. Um, that's one that's still really around. Hemp Oil Canada is also as a bulk supplier. And then with us, HPS Food and Ingredients. So yeah, so those are some of the major brands that are still out there. And then some of them changed names over time. So you had Ancient Harvest, which became Living Harvest, which became Tempt. So you'll see the Tempt brand out there. They've got the Hemp Milk and the Hemp Tempeh. So, you know, some of these brands have been around a long time, but they may have changed <clears throat> their marketing or their brand name um, to develop further down the line. I see. So 
in terms of fiber production, is there how is that going in Canada and, and across the, the North America? I think we're finally, finally, Paul, starting to see some traction there, um, which is also something I, I have a hard time still wrapping my mind around is that, you know, when I when I first came to the Parkland Growers, you know, it was about fiber because it thought, oh, it's going to take forever to get this food thing together. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's quicker to get food, I guess, in your bellies than it is in an animal belly, because that's another thing that we're still really working for is looking at getting hemp feeds registered so that hemp can be put into feeds, which still technically, now in some states, they have placed some regulations in place to be able to, um, to, to put it in feed and all, and I'll give you a referral and you can have Jen, one of our team on to discuss what's going on in the animal feed sector. I think it's a really interesting sector right now that needs push. Um, but yeah, fiber starting now, we've got some processing facilities that are now being built to actually do the decortication. And, and the nice thing about that is it gives the, oper the farmer an opportunity to increase his farm gate. Because if you've got a farmer who's under contract for grain, well, they're going to have some fiber left over. Whether or not it's a short stature variety or a mid stature variety, you're going to have that. So it gives that farmer another opportunity here to, you know, harvest the grain. You know, maybe he has an opportunity, he, she has that opportunity to click the chaff. Maybe that can go off, which here in Canada also... An interesting thing about our regulations is any of the flowering parts of hemp fall outside of the hemp regulations and are part of the marijuana regulations. Oh, okay. So anything with CBD, any of that stuff, that's all considered on the adult use marijuana side of the market. So if you want to buy CBD products, you have to go to an adult use store and buy them. I see. So it's age restricted. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, in the U.S. where you can go down to, you know, the local convenience store and buy a CBD product. Oh, I, I was a keynote speaker at the Texas Hemp Conference a couple of years back, just the month before the, the pandemic lockdown started back in 2020. And I was amazed because I grew up in Dallas, Texas. It's good to go back there like that. But uh, there were these CBD stores selling smokable flowers. And they couldn't enforce the marijuana laws in Texas because of that, because they look and smell uh, like like THC strong flowers, too. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely not regulated. I don't know how that's changed since 2020, but uh, uh, that's not possible in Canada. No, it's absolutely not. So, yeah, so anything to do grain, it goes off. And once it's processed and it's and the, those finished products are 10 ppm or less THC, then they are a free for sale product. I mean, of course, you have to have all the other food quality assurance done also. That's not part of the hemp regulations. That's just part of clean foods. Um, but, you know, once you get to the 10 ppm or less THC on a hemp food product derived from hemp seed grain, then that's a free for sale product. Anything to do with the flowering parts or the chaff or anything that you're going to do any extraction for, for CBD or any other cannabinoid that falls into the marijuana section. So can a farmer still market that or do they have to destroy it? No, they can still sell that. So they would they could still have the opportunity to sell that, but they have to sell it to somebody who's got the licensing underneath this the can the marijuana side of the cannabis act. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, Paul, who took the word marijuana away from us? I want to know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know that either. Really peeves me off. Like, you know, we fought so hard to free the word marijuana and to make it you know, a, a safe word. And now all of a sudden it's like, no, we're not going to call it marijuana anymore. We're going to call it cannabis. And I'm like, it, it, I'm like, cannabis is a scientific name, folks. It's, you know, marijuana, it's hemp. They're both cannabis. So that's just another thing I have. I'm like, free the word marijuana again. Let's bring it back. Um, right. But yeah, but going back to the fiber side, now that we're starting to see the fiber decortication facilities come on here um, and the great work that's going on stateside also with, you know, textile development and, you know, so starting to see that start to turn around now that you've got like the Hemp Building Association really pushing for those accreditations for hemp building. 
just last week or like in the last two weeks, um, Dunn Agro, which some good friends of ours from the Netherlands, you know, them building their facility. I do believe it's going to be in Indiana, I do believe, um, you know, built, bringing that technology over. And that's really, that's going to be the tide that's going to turn the hemp industry is when we start seeing that fiber production coming on and then you get those textiles, you get the non-wovens, the press boards, the plastic composites, and it starts feeding into paper as, your, as part of your history, starts really feeding into some more of those general stream products so we can see hemp and craft paper boxes. Um, you know, so I think that that's, that's one of those things that's gonna really change the farming dynamic. And, and also to look historically, you know, about what was happening in the hemp industry back in the um, pre-prohibition days, the pre-marijuana tax act days, you know, how they would grow fiber only in certain regions and growing the planting seed maybe more in the northern regions uh, and then shipping that planting seed down and then and then growing out for fiber. So it will be interesting to see how that changes um, the ability for us to crop uh, you know, on, on larger and small scale agriculture to be able to bring those stocks in and, and sell those. And I know you've spent a great deal of time in, in Asia also seeing the different ways that, you know, their small plot growing and harvesting for, for the textile industry. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, there I've seen lately, you know, hemp wood products, they say are harder than in uh, oak and hickory and they're making flooring out of it that's really taking off and uh, another product that really intrigued me is the hip tensils the uh, hip fiber and cornstarch i guess is what those are made of and they compost so you have this compostable plastic that could solve such a major problem with our environment the fiber that's what motivated me to really concentrate on the fiber products was the environmental benefits of that and uh you know i named my company tree free eco paper with the idea of it being ecological and uh, economical too but uh back to your background a little bit more so there was a time i remember where your job was to go into the fields and test other farmers crops for their are you still doing that or how long a period of time did you do that for oh man at one point in yeah. time my i was told i probably i walked more walked more miles in hemp than any other person alive um, because uh. i was the principal hemp sampler for the canadian prairies for almost seven or eight years and i would spend um, the greater sum of three weeks on the road pulling the sample so the previous regulations had authorized samplers were individual persons that had um, their certified agrologists and had background in agriculture could apply to become a sampler and then the farmer would you you would arrange with the farmer to come to their field so sometimes i would do that directly with the contractors and so then they didn't have to worry about it they would give me the list i would call all the farmers i would make the arrangements um which you know was like drive three miles down this dirt road and when you see a rock turn right and go another mile and a half and then you'll see the field yeah and let me tell you some of these fields were huge and you're, you're supposed to zigzag through them so i you know i learned a lot of things like you know you need a whistle on you when i was in the tall fields i would have a really long flag with me um, that just in case I fell down or hurt or came on a moose or something in the field, I would like smack dab in front of a moose once. Um, you know, they're scary animals um, and they're huge. So, you know, those kind of things I, I had to take some precautions about because when you get in there and the hemp's taller than you are and you are like kind of trying to run into the field to get different samples, uh, you kind of end up getting lost. Um, so that happened a couple of times too. And I ended up on the quarter mile section down the road and had to walk back to find my car. And then I would collect the samples. I would bring them back. I would prep them and send them to the lab. So now the regulations are allowed the farmers to go and take the samples to, to send them off, which is, which is much better. It takes out another level and another cost to the farmer. So he doesn't have to pay an individual person to come out and do it. They can go and since they're licensed and now are trusted by the government to grow the hemp, they can take the sample. For a while there, the government got rid of the field test on certified fields. So when you were planted certified hemp seed and you were growing grain, 
they said, okay, it's grown in a pedigreed system. You don't need to do that anymore. But then they changed that and, and took it back and said, no, we want to see the fact that the plants that these grains are go growing on are 0.3% or less THC. And, and we, uh, you know, and you can get the list of approved cultivars by going to the Canadian um, government's website, Health Canada website, li search list of approved cultivars. And then you'll see if there was any like spikes and, and there really hasn't been um, any spikes in, in any of the fields because they're well maintained underneath a pedigree seed system. I see. So, but you used to have spikes in those fields before that, I think. Some of them, um, you know, there were some, you know, varieties that were spiking, but still, you know, I mean, it's spiking at like 3.5% THC. So still nothing um, that was coming across in the food products when the when it was great when it was harvested. And I know we've had this discussion before about, you know, I know we got one percenters out there. Let's bring it up to one percent, you know, and, and what level is that? And, you know, is 10 ppm THC too tight of a narrow delta nine narrow of a um, level for for safety? Could it be higher than that? And, um, you know, that's one of those things that Ernie Small would be the one to, you know, since he's part of the team that tagged that 10 ppm and 0.3%, what was the reasonings behind that? And then, you know, 50 times safer than what they than what they actually thought it was going to be. Um, so I think we've got a lot of room to move there when it comes to looking at the impacts of these cannabinoids on our bodies in, in, a, in a positive way and, and not negative or a potential negative effect. So, you know, we've met several times at various events. Do you have any events coming up? Are you going to be at this Thailand uh, conference in November, December? I'm sure hoping. It depends on how the unvaxxed world um, can open up. So right now we're still in Manitoba, um, still very limited on our, our ability to travel. So, yeah, Ooh. I'm hoping I'll be there. But, you know, right now my focus has really been you know, my full-time work, you know, helping out the Hemp Industry Association, and then also a group of concerned parents here. We've now started a regenerative education nonprofit in which we're putting together programming for local homeschooled kids to be able to do nature-based education. So, you know, becoming a mom and a parent, as you well know, that starts to shift some of the things that you're doing in your life, and that's, um, been one of them is trying to focus on our community and the education that our children's are getting um you know looking at what's going wrong in our public health our, our public school system and then how can we help that and help these parents and um, get this nature-based education and we just had our, our our event just this past weekend and of the 12 families that attended it was the first time they had attended a nature-based education program i see here in portland where they have a one nature program for sixth graders where they go to camp for five days, I think, and they're, they're taught about biology out in the field here. But you've really taken a lead in this and what a perfect segue to talk about your new book. Mm. You wanna tell yes. us about that? Yeah, so it's Everyone Loves Tralala -la, and Tralala -la is a little hemp seed and it was first written by an Austrian gentlemen and lady um and basically I, it was through a company called Hothwell which means hemp world and they're based in Austria and they had this amazing amazing booth back VOFAC is the world's largest organic tra trade show it's held normally in Nuremberg Germany I attended many times and became friends with some of the team there at Hothwell and so I, I went to their booth and I was like, what's up in the back of your booth? And it was this children's book. I'll just, I got it. I got one right here. Yeah. So da, 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 there it is. Oh, it blocked me out. There it goes. Everyone loves tra la la. There she is. A little hemp seed. And so I, I was, I, I said, oh, can I see the book? Well, it was written in German, Austrian dialect, German. And of course I couldn't read it, but I could look at the pages. I could look at the pictures and I just fell in love with it. So for the next like three days of the trade show, I was dragging all of my friends over to their book to look at this book. Uh -huh. And they thought, they were like, you are, you are an odd nut there, Andrea. You're like geeking out over this little children's book. And I was like, it's so great. The images are great. What awesome watercolors. 
So the last day of the trade show, they show up at the Canadian Pavilion event and they're all dressed in like these traditional um, Austrian attire and they show up at the booth and they bring me the book. They only had one book with them and it was like found in a box. They didn't even intentionally bring it. So they gave me the book and I just was elated. Like I was so happy. My friends, um, Daniel Cruza from over at Hemp Pro International in Germany. And I said, oh, can you read it to me, him and Rebecca? And they're like, ah, well, it's a little hard to read and be having beers at the same time. And so I said, okay, so I brought the book home and it kind of, it was around my house and I was part of the WOOF program, the Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. And from that, they, um, I had a woofer named Norma Urban come. She was fluent in English and had studied English in her university. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I have a German staying with me for like two whole weeks. She can read me the book. And she also said it's very difficult to read and translate simultaneously. Um, there's context there, just words, you know, like the word patio. She was like, she didn't know what word this word was and how to translate the word patio because it meant something kind of different in German, but it means the same thing as patio. Um, so anyways, I said, so Norma said, oh, well, you know, why don't I just translate the book as a gift to you? And I said, wow, really? You put this book in English, then we're going to publish this book. And so immediately, as soon as she said to me that she would do that, I contacted the um, authors and we signed an agreement for me to take over the rights of the book in all languages and all countries, except for in the German language and in Austria. Um, so I can't republish it in German. And I and so that's my that's the only caveat is I can't republish it in, in German. So it took a lot of years, um, almost sort of nine years for me to really finish it. it. Because of the fact for such a long time, Paul, as you know, I was on the road all the time. And, you know, and, and you know what I say, like leading a revolution, part of the leadership of a revolution. And I was always on the road. So it was something that I would work on here and there. And I would have friends that would proof it for me and we would make some editorial changes. And then in the last year, um, my friend Greg Favall said, Andrea, just do it. Just pick it back up and do it. So I picked the book back up and, and got somebody to help me push it through and, and finish it up and get it all programmed so that's now on Amazon. So I'm loving the fact that I've got, you know, one's a chapter book. So it's a, it's a short chapter book. Um, and, you know, I've been reading it to Ezra. He's four. So, you know, I mean, you can read it to the kids or all the way up to, you know, I think adults. I've had adults tell me they've got a lot out of the book. But it's really, for me, um, the first kind of hemp book of its sort um, for children that I've seen out on the market. There are other great hemp and marijuana and cannabis education books that are that are driven towards um, towards towards children. But this is this is a standalone one in itself is talking about farming and what you can use and and friendship. So I'll just read that little back blurb of it. Jeez. Everyone loves tralala. Tralala is a hemp seed who lives on an organic farm called Hemp World. And I repositioned the book to be part of the Great Plains. And I talk about the Plains Indians and how we, we were on their land. Um, one sunny morning, a friendly, elderly, black and white tomcat tells Tralala all about the field of the singing flowers. Tralala wants to visit the mysterious field and she pleads with the cat to take her there. And so begins an exciting adventure into the world of hemp as she discovers who she is and what she will be. Tralala learns a lot about the amazing plant she will once become, and her experiences are animated characters on the farm remind her of how important it is to have good friends. So it's really been um, very well received, and from that, now I've created a, a toddler version, so a simplified version, which will be coming out in the next short while, um, also listed on Amazon. So you can check it out, tralalahempseed.com, or pop, pop over to Amazon and and search it there and hopefully paul you'll post a a, a link also somewhere um we'll on part of yours the link on the tv show here and uh and, and elsewhere so yeah so I'm, i've been really excited about it it's it's kind of brought out the kid in me and and, and then thinking about how i can do it and anybody listening if you're interested in and in translating you becoming a translator in another way. love to diversify the the concept of the book and have Tralala, you know, travel to other countries to meet her family 
I think that would be very interesting also to have a kind of spinoffs in the book in other languages um, and, and, uh, and other settings and other stories that can be told about the rich hemp history that's out there that is, you know, now really being embraced and being brought forward again by um, by both the older and younger generations. Well, good work on getting that out there. So Amazon is the place to go find it. That's right. So um, Amazon, you can go and get it. You can go to the website if you want to sign copy you can go to the website and, and purchase a signed copy but you have to do that through the, the website but I have had people that have purchased it on Amazon and then they send me the book I do my signing and, and, and send it back so there's a few different options there so you can reach out to me directly um, Andrea for hemp or tralala hemp seed at gmail.com so you can go to those and or go to the website and drop me in um, a message through the website what's the website um, tralala hemp seed.com Okay. So T L A L A, um, hempseed.com. All right. And in terms of your business and what, what links should we uh, put up and, and where can people who want more information about growing hemp contact? I would say the best link for the concept of growing hemp would be hempproductionservices.com. So hempproductionservices.com. That's the bulk hemp food company, which we do direct contracting with producers in Canada and the U.S. So and have our agronomy team and, and knowledge with our sister company of what varieties are working well, because most of our varieties are in all of the leading variety trials across the U.S., so we have a lot of a, a, a really a really fine fine staff of agronomists and team that are working closely with the producers and then the quality assurance to make sure that the the end product going onto the market is safe um, for human consumption. That's great. You know, I get contacted by people in Latin America for fiber seeds and 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 grain varieties and CBG varieties. So. Uh, what is that website again? Uh, HempProductionServices.com. All right. Well, is to say in closing, Andre. Well, I'll just say, you know, thank you, Paul. Thank you to all the listeners, and you know, keep keep living the dream and keep spreading the word, and 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 just keep keep it up because we are not done yet. This revolution is not. We still have so much time and so much work that has to be done. Um, so I, I just have been extremely blessed person to have been involved in, in this sector and, you know, and have had the opportunities given to me so that I can inspire so many others. And that's what's been for me the, the most gratifying is to walk away and be like, wow, I, I did that one. I worked really hard to make that happen. And then to have so many people come forward and, and to be able to say thank you um, is, is really amazing. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Andre. It's been a pleasure to have you back on the show again. Um, I'm looking forward to getting an autographed copy of that book here pretty soon. I don't have any grandkids yet to read it to, but uh, uh, it'll be ready when they are. That's okay. Maybe, you know, sometime at a hemp stock, you can have one for when you do a kid's thing. You can have a reading or something like that. That would be fun. Would, that would. Well, thanks yeah, again. Yeah, you know, I think. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. All right. You have a good day and uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for your your dedication and lifetime of work on this. It's been an honor to 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 meet up with you and have you here on the show today.